Hello, welcome to our Think Big series brought to you by PSG. My name is Charles Lombard and I'm the National Sales Manager of External Retail Sales at PSG Asset Management. PSG is a leading financial services group with an extensive national footprint in South Africa and a presence in Namibia. We've been in operation since 1998 and pride ourselves on providing a bigger picture approach to our clients' financial needs, from asset, wealth management, to short-term insurance. We offer clients access to a wide range of insurance and investment products based on comprehensive advice. Our clients benefit from access to proprietary products and solutions, as well as a comprehensive list of third-party products. The Think Big series is a collection of dialogues with leading speakers hosted by award-winning financial journalist, Bruce Whitfield. We aim to bring our audiences independent insights that help them formulate their own opinions on some of our country's most pressing issues. Uncertainty and challenges continue to abound, but armed with knowledge, we are better equipped to chart the way forward. South Africa's electoral system was originally envisioned as a temporary system. Last year, the Constitutional Court confirmed the need to transition to a new system that allows for independent candidates. This is just one of the challenges ahead for our constitution. In today's session, Bruce talks to Rulf Meyer, an obvious choice to talk us through the future of South Africa's constitution. Rulf is a lawyer by profession. He served as Minister of Defense and of Constitutional Affairs in the cabinet of former President F.W. de Klerk and was intimately involved in the negotiations on the settlement of the South African conflict as chief negotiator for the national party government. It was in this capacity that he negotiated the end of apartheid together with Cyril Ramaphosa, who was the chief negotiator for the African National Congress. These negotiations resulted in the first democratic elections in South Africa at the end of April 1994. After the election, Rulf continued in the portfolio of constitutional affairs in the cabinet of former president Nelson Mandela. He is presently a director of in Transformation Initiative, a South African-based institution that does facilitation and advisory work in and outside of the country. Our social media campaign is hashtag ThinkBigPSG. This series is free, shareable, and open to anyone interested, whether you're a PSG client or not. I'd now like to hand over to Bruce. Charles, thank you very much indeed. Ruf May, good to see you again. It's been a little while. I mean, whew, things move quickly in South Africa. At the time that we are having this chat, um, South Africa is reeling from the, the shock and awe and the horror of the most extraordinary series of attacks on shopping malls, on attempted attacks on harbors and on gas installations and chemical factories. I mean, it's been a, a terrifying couple of weeks for South Africa. What's your high level reading of what's really going on? Well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Bruce. It's nice talking to you and nice to see you again. Uh, this, uh, this, these events of the last few weeks, I think, uh, indicate at least the, the worst moment in, uh, in South Africa's post uh, democracy era, uh, in other words, since 1994. Uh, and, and, you know, there are different explanations for it. Of, of course, it started with the imprisonment of, of Jacob Zuma. Uh, and, and many would, uh, would say that it was a planned result as, uh, as, a, as, a, as a fact that he was imprisoned at the time. And, and maybe it was during the first few days uh, that way, but I think we can also say that as time went on, uh, criminality took over, <laughs> and and uh, and and the reaction that we saw, generally speaking, uh, reminded us of what we have seen back in the 1980s in South Africa, uh, 
you know, so typical unrest of a, of a nature that became almost uncontrollable. Thankfully, the, the security forces after a few days stepped in and it, it started to look better. But I think we have to address also some of the underlying questions that, that came out in this process. And maybe this is an opportunity to talk about those as well. Uh, firstly, on the side of government, the security forces, uh, they were obviously not totally ready for it. Uh, they came late to the scene. Uh, the intelligence uh, that should have been in place seemingly was not there. So those are, are things that, that came out in this process and that need clear uh, attention, focus. But then there are also on the other side, the underlying factors with regard to what made people coming out in the way they did. Uh, is it in fact linked to inequality, poverty, unemployment and things like that? And I think those are the questions that we as South Africans have to address. Let's, let's talk about the failure of intelligence. Let's talk about the failure of security forces to react. I've been doing a lot of research into SASRIA, which is the government owned insurance company that is going to have to stump up for my, many of the losses that have been incurred in recent weeks. It was created in 1979 following the 1976 uprising when commercial insurers went, no, thank you, we don't want to take on the, the rising political risk in South Africa. And it's been brilliantly run. It's one of the few state owned enterprises that is solvent, that hasn't had bad audits, that is, you know, got no, no scandal attached to it. The problem is it was never designed with in, in sort of with the, with the consideration that the state would take a week to respond um, to civil unrest. Um, it, it was created on the assumption of if you have civil unrest, the state acts uh, and, and deals with the outbreaks of civil unrest and goes from case to case to case, but it's contained. The, what was terrifying about this was the sheer incompetence or reluctance or failure, whatever it was, of the state to intervene. And I'm sure in the fullness of time, we'll learn exactly what did happen. But I mean, that I think was the most terrifying aspect of this thing was not that people felt the need or the ability or the desire or the passion to do it. The fact is that the state was completely nowhere to be seen for days and days and days. Yeah, I think it has probably to be linked to, to three aspects. The one is, I think the intelligence was not in place. They, they might, might say they, they've had, <laughs> the warnings and the alerts out, but at least there were no proper communications between the different state organs, state uh, security, police and or the military. So there, there was a, there was a, uh, a distraction there of a kind between those services. The, the, the second factor I think is the one that it was probably, you, I, I, can, I can imagine that was quite possible. In order to, 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 to not allow a situation like Marikana to happen again, in other words, where the police and or other security elements would come out and start shooting. So I think that was, a, if it's through, a correct decision, because I can imagine those behind what, what, what happened, um, the instigators, would have loved that situation, a repeat of Marikana to happen. And then the third one was, of course, the fact that I think the, the military was called in too late. They should have been there on the first day already. Now, obviously, their presence made a big difference. The moment they arrived on the scene, according to all reports, people started to, um, to, 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 to resist from getting out and behaving the way that they did prior to that. So, but all of this have to be revisited. And, and I hope there will be clear reports afterwards. There's a lot of speculation uh, and a lot of analysts talking about it, having their own opinions. Um, but, but I think there is an opportunity here. And if I would have been in the position of the president, I would have said, let's revisit our security system as a whole, not only intelligence. I mean, there's so, there's so many armchair critics of what has happened in the last couple of weeks with absolutely no factual basis whatsoever, thumb suck analysis um, in, in the absence of facts. I mean, and I think that's perfectly natural. But I wonder, to fall into that very trap that I've just criticized, whether or not we can see parallels between what was happening in South Africa in the last couple of weeks and what happened uh, in the United States before 9-11, where ostensibly there was intelligence, ostensibly there were reports and stuff, information was flowing around, it just didn't go to where it was needed. 
I wonder how much of that was at play in the South African security services, which don't appear to be riddled with discipline, process, and structure. Yeah, it's a good point, uh, Bruce. And, and, but the Americans somehow learned out of that experience of 9-11. Uh, and I think we should learn from this experience. Uh, this can happen again. We can be in different proportions. It can be much bigger. We've seen what happened in neighboring uh, Mozambique uh, recently in the last two or three years. And the same kind of thing can happen here. And, uh, you know, with a different motive, a different agenda, etc. And we are obviously, if we take the recent experiences into uh, account, then we are not ready for something like that. You know, the Americans that time reacted by means of establishing the Department of Homeland Security. You know, um, whether it was the right naming for it uh, doesn't matter, but I think it was the right approach that was followed. And I think that the leading security experts in South Africa should come forward with ideas. And, and there are such people, both within the structures uh, of the state, but also outside. And I think we need collaboration between the two to come up with the best ideas and advice to the president to say, let's do the following. It's a fabulous quote from a proper revolutionary. Somebody goes back to 1789. You'll know Voltaire, of course, uh, from the French Revolution. There's a quote attributed to him that goes something along the lines of, anybody who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. And that seems mm -hmm. to have an element of truth in what has happened in South Africa in the last little while. Yeah, you're right. I, I, I never thought of that one. <laughs> but it's true. I mean... Look at what happened. Nobody expected something like that today to, to, to happen this day and age in South Africa. We are a democracy. We are a functioning democracy. And, and this kind of thing was just unbelievable. I, 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 can, I can recall the shock that I have had myself in first observing it, let alone people from outside, from the international community. I had messages like all of us from all over the world about this. And it was a very sad moment. I felt ashamed myself personally for the fact that South Africa let itself demonstrate itself in this way to the international world. It's terrible. Did you at any point in the, as the fires were burning, think to yourself that all of the work that you've done for the last 30 years in trying to secure a peaceful transition in a democratic South Africa was in itself about to go up in flames? Well, it, it, it was for one or two moments, maybe, that, that uh, recall of what happened during the process of the negotiations. You, you will remember when we had the breakdowns twice, yep. very serious breakdowns in the negotiations. And those of us that were close to the scene, I think at that, at those, in those moments, thought, well, we're going back to the bush, so to speak. Yep. Uh, and, and I think in the weeks, recent weeks, we have We've also had uh, some of those images that made us think, are we really derailing the state of democracy? The, 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 what we have built up over 30 years, 27 years. But at the same time, I think, you know, and I speak for myself, uh, the fact that we can say we are a functioning democracy now, today, even after the unrest, proves the point that we that we are, we are in good shape. We are going in the right direction. Um, and I think that's and a very important point to remember because a lot of people, I mean, South Africa is the, the land of knee jerks. If knee jerk was a, was a sport, we'd be winning gold medals at the Olympics right now because we're very good at that. We're also very good at the sport of shooting ourselves in the foot um, and other national sports of, of self-infliction. Uh, self I'm, I'm interested to, to just press a little bit on the idea of a functioning democracy. A lot of people would disagree. A lot of people would say, hold on a second, how can we possibly be a functioning democracy when you've got a political party that has been in power with no real threat of losing that power, perhaps until recently, in 27 years? I mean, is that a sign of a functioning democracy or is that just a sign of a, a one-party state as long as you know the, the party of liberation stays in power, everybody's happy? Uh, and as long as nobody interferes in the internal affairs of that, that uh, ruling party, then we can keep peace and stability. That doesn't feel like a functioning democracy. It, it feels a little bit more sinister than that. 
Well, you know, it, de it depends on what is the definition of functioning democracy. In my terms, it would mean that you have a constitution that is supreme, which is the case with us, and it has proved to be the case, especially during the time of the Zuma administration. On, on almost on a monthly basis, there were challenges against him and that administration in the constitutional court. And every time the constitution was the winner in terms of, of the adjudication of, of, of the constitutional court. So I think it's a, it's a point that we have to rely on as a, as a definition of what means democracy. But when it comes to the, uh, the way in which it's playing out in the political field, uh, you and I and the constitution have very little control over that. Uh, it's, it's back to the voters. And if the voters in the particular situation still coming back with the same party as the pref party of preference, there's, there's nothing that the constitution can do about that. Uh, the question I think in that regard, if I might just conclude on this point, I think the, the question in that regard is, <clears throat> is, the, is the ruling party able to redefine itself or renew itself? And I think that is the big question that South Africans are facing at the moment. Um, if I look at other democracies, other functioning democracies, the best example that often comes to my mind is the one of Germany, where the ruling party in that case is in, in, in control, or the majority ruling party because it's, it's often coalitions that, that, that run that country. But the majority in the, in the ruling coalition is there for decades. It's the same party, for decades. But in the way in which it is renewing itself, it enables itself to continue. And, and I think this is the thing that the ANC has to look into. And specifically now, because now the it, it seems there's more clarity as to the direction the ANC can follow, if it depends on Cyril Ramaphosa, I would say. When, I mean, people have for a long time have not believed for a moment that Jacob Zuba would ever see the inside of a jail cell. And his arrest, I think, came as much as a surprise to critics of the system as it did to his supporters. Um, I'm not too sure many people actually believed it would happen, and it did. And that maybe goes to the very fundamental point about the supremacy of the constitution and the nature of the constitutional democracy under which we live. Yeah, you know, it's, it reminds to me, it reminds sad that Jacob Zuma is behind bars. Yeah. A, a person of his age should not be in that position. But the sad thing is he brought it over himself. And whether he was depending completely on bad legal advice, I don't know. But, you know, he brought it over himself. The fact is that he's in prison for not adhering to a court order of the highest court in the country, the Constitutional Court. That's as, as simple as it is. It's not about the Zonda Commission or whatever. It's about an order of the Constitutional Court that he didn't adhere to. And, and that is, it's very sad, you know, None of us should rejoice in the fact that he's behind bars because that should not be the case. And, and why let this happen, I can't explain. It's, 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 it goes beyond my understanding. In the same way, this campaign to free him is also silly because it doesn't address the real fundamentals of the state, of the democracy that we live in. Um, if you compare that with the Free Mandela campaign, there's no comparison at all. No comparison whatsoever. How worried about, I mean, I, I asked you this question at a PSG conference, I think in 2017, and I said to you, if social media had existed at the time that you and Sir Ramaphosa were having your behind the scenes negotiations, could you have made it work? And you at that point said, you didn't think it was like simply because you needed that privacy, you needed the intimacy, you needed the time, you needed that absolute trust that you built up between yourselves at that time. And social media tends to undermine all of that because it is just this vulgar hotbed of dissent, misinformation, outright lies and, and gross manipulation of, of crowds. Yeah, it is, uh, Bruce, and the worst example of what social media can do to distract the nation almost 
was what Donald Trump did with his yes. tweets. You know, that's a that's a terrible example that he had set in that regard. Um, so the point that remains absolutely true, and that is that if we had social media at the time when we were negotiating, it would have been impossible almost to uh, to reach agreements like we did. Um, at the same time, I, I also want to say that we had the benefit of a, of a very loyal media at the time that we were negotiating, loyal towards the country and its interests. It was critical of what we did wrong, but it was at the same time very positive about the need for, a, for, for, a, for an outcome that would determine a visionary future for the country. And, and, and the way in which we could interact with the media in those days. And it was quite transparent, at least, with the formal media, as it was, as it uh, were at the time. Uh, and, and, and that helped a lot. That transparency and the, and the loyalist way in which the media covered the proceedings, I think helped a lot, not only for us as, as uh, individual role players, but for the country at large to bring across what was happening at the negotiating table and project it in such a way that we had the support for it in the end. You know, I, I keep on reminding others in similar situations elsewhere in the world that in the South African case, we didn't even require a referendum to agree on what we negotiated. People accepted it. They accepted the outcome. There was no call for a referendum by anybody. The outcome was, in other words, so transparent through the media that people went out and say, it's fine, we accept it, what uh, was negotiated. The vast majority, I think, of media in South Africa have played that role ever since the, the days of the Gupta emails, for example. Without those disclosures, yeah. I think we would have been set back many, many years. Jacob Zuma might even still be in office, or if not him, certainly a proxy for him uh, would be in office. Absolutely. I totally agree with that. And, and that's an absolute fundamental fact. I mean, I test myself every morning when I get up. The first thing I do is to read the reliable media, at least those that are reliable in my mind. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's the first thing. That's the base of information. That is, that is what keeps the country going. But I also want to add the role of civil society in general, that have become very active. You know, the the number of institutions within civil society that became active participants in keeping us on track and keeping the politicians on track. If you look at those court cases I referred to that took Jim, uh, Jacob Zuma to the Constitutional Court, the most of them were coming from civil society institutions that took him on within the parameters of the Constitution and the law. And, and I think we can say that, you know, we have a very active, very dynamic civil society as far as that is. The latest, latest one is the campaign led by Frank Chikani as, as far as the Defend Democracy campaign is concerned. It's fantastic what they do. Uh, I, I watch it from the sideline, but, but this is the way in which South Africans react when they feel the Constitution is under threat. Because it is all we've got. I mean, that, that, that is the point. Uh, lots of people will tell you that South Africa is an absolute mess and it's quite hard to argue against that point. We have problems, big, big problems. Uh, go back to the point you made earlier about the steady progression that South Africa has made. Not only have we hosted you know, multiple um, national elections, we've done provincial elections, we've done municipal elections, free and fair elections undisputed over that time. Um, and you know, while some people may disagree with the outcomes, there's never been a very a serious challenge to, um, to the election outcomes. It gets a little bit more hairy, though, as that ANC majority is threatened. Right now, um, the ANC is polling below 50% as we go towards um, local government elections. Those are unlikely to happen in October. Dikhang Mosineke has recommended going out to, to February next year, and that is a sensible precaution. It will have to be, of course, ratified. But the democracy, the state of the democracy is all well and good. But when you've got 40% of people who no matter what they do, they can stand on their heads and sing the national anthem until their heads burst. They can't get a job. Um, and, and it's that loss of faith in the future that I think is 
what is most scary about South Africa right now? Yeah, you know, it, maybe we should uh, we should look at what can be done from from us as South African side in general, politicians, business, civil society, labor, all sectors of, of, of what make up this society. Um, and, and, you know, the burning question in my mind, and I think in many of us, our, our minds, is, is, is what can be done about the state of inequality that still prevails 27 years into our democratic state? We still have high levels of inequality, in probably some areas higher than even before. Uh, so inequality, poverty, unemployment are the burning issues. And I think, you know, the way in which it was spelled out during the recent unrest, was elements of that, um, you know, brought back the fact that we have to address this. And, and, and to my mind, the, the, the basic issue that I have to be addressed in this regard is the economic model that we are following. We have to ask ourselves, did we do a, the right thing when we, when we transitioned from apartheid to democracy by allowing the same kind of economic model to carry on? And I'm not an economist. All I'm saying is, I think that model is not serving the purposes of the majority of South Africans. And I think we have to address that. We have to look at what can be done to follow examples from elsewhere in the world that address similar challenges under difficult circumstances and brought about the required results. So maybe, you know, and I've resisted the concept in my mind ever since it was first raised, and that is the idea of an economic Odessa. I resist that concept because I said, you can't repeat within the economic framework what happened at the time during the process of the political negotiations. But maybe we should call it something different. Just don't name it an economic goddess. And, and and I think there was a proposal that was put on the table 15 years ago, I think, by Clem Sunter, who first raised exactly. it. Public exactly. is idea. So we need an economic condition. Oh, shut up, Clem. You don't know yeah. what we do. We're growing. Unemployment is falling. And Clem was looking into the future and saying, guys, at some point, this runs yeah. out of road. And we've hit that point. We've run out of road. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a fundamental renegotiation of the future. Um, and it doesn't come without exactly. risk. Um, it doesn't come without risk because it, this is where populism comes to the fore. But I think where we can learn from Codessa was that proper negotiators, robust negotiators, as far apart as they might be at the beginning, can be brought to a point of mutual unhappiness, which is probably the point where we need to get to. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're, you're absolutely addressing a key point, which made me in the past think that we can't enter that space of having an economic Codessa. But the more and more, you know, one, one contemplates in recent times about the situation and the fact that we are not making progress in addressing the needs related to inequality and poverty and unemployment. Make me think more and more that we should actually come up with a, with a way of addressing it, uh, repeating the same fundamentals that we had with, that led to our success there. And one of the major success factors, Bruce, was the fact that we succeeded in bringing together a strong center of South Africans, different political persuasions that kept the country to together during the transition. And then later on came the Zuma years, and that center just totally uh, fractured. There was nothing left of the center. We are slowly starting to rebuild it. And I think it, um, it's on that basis that we can actually now enter into this um, economic uh, comparison of a, of a Codesa, where we can get all the players around the table. It will obviously have to be government, labor, business, civil society, and, and, and the rest. And the political persuasions or political parties themselves too. But, but I think we have to 
We have to bring the best minds in the country together to focus on this. And I think it, it, it will, of necessity, uh, lead to a complete redefinition of the economic model that we are sitting on, uh, or, or a review of the economic model that we're sitting on, and, 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 and with a way of, of creating a new vision for the country, as far as that subject is concerned. Let's, let's be honest with ourselves. We made a successful political transition, but the socioeconomic transformation didn't happen. And it's now 27 years later. And we have to face the reality of that. And it's the task of the president and, the, and, the, and his executive, but it's similarly the task of you and I as, as, as citizens of this country. Otherwise, we're going to pay the price of what we have seen in the last few weeks on a repetitive basis in the future. And I mean, you know, people who are hungry are vulnerable to any kind of promise and any kind exactly. of suggestion. Um, you know, democracy is not working for you. Well, then you look for something different. And you know, no amount of telling that it'll get worse <laughs> really matters to you at that point. And that, I suppose, is, is the ultimate crisis. I, th I think we discussed how robust the Constitution is. I think we've tested the robustness of the Constitution. We've got a couple of questions that have come through. Um, how can we safeguard against the eroding of Chapter 9 institutions? I think it goes back to the point that you made of eternal vigilance and eternal criticism and eternal... You know, being completely alert to, you know, threats like, you know, Jacob Zuma and others. Yeah. Well, you know, let's keep in mind the Constitution is the framework. It's the it's the supreme authority, and it's one of the strong points about where we find ourselves on an ongoing basis in the country. Um, but but those institutions that were created in the area by the Constitution so-called chapter nine institutions, depend on a large extent on, on who are the people who are, who are filling the positions as far as those institutions are concerned. Uh, we were, I think, very fortunate so far as far as the, as far as the composition of the Constitutional Court is concerned. Uh, the Constitutional Court set an example for all of us, but also for others in the rest of the world in terms of the way in which it adjudicates on its functions as, as the highest court in the, in, in the country. But then we had other examples, like the public prosecutor. Public protector, public protector. Uh, sorry, public uh, protector. My apology. The public protector, where we had differences of, uh, of the way in which that position, that, uh, that uh, institution was, was carrying out its responsibilities. And we all know what is the current position as far as that is. So it, it depends on, on the personalities who fill those jobs and those responsibilities on behalf of the constitution. Then South Africa needs higher confidence levels, says somebody, specifically for fixed investment. What prognosis can you offer five, 10 years ahead? And maybe just to fill in a little on that question. I was chatting to Jaco Marie the other day, who was one of the presidential investment envoys. And he is never going to admit it, but I think he's feeling very, very despondent. Um, and you know, one of the things he did say is, well, you know, foreign investors aren't going to be here coming here anytime soon until they see how we respond. Um, and for so many people with money in South Africa, they've been so focused on getting it out um, and then we're you know, expecting others to come and invest inwardly in our country when the vast majority of people who are taking money out uh, don't see a future themselves. And that's a big problem uh, in terms of a future. What sort of guidance can you give on that particular front? You, think? Because you know better than I do as far as uh, this subject is concerned. <laughs> so you should not ask me that question. But as a, as a, as a lay person in, in that field, I, I would say, you know what? What comes to my mind on an ongoing basis are two things. The one is the resilience of the South African uh, community is amazing. We've seen it during the, the, the recent unrest again. The way in which South Africans reacted and responded to that period of, of uncertainty was amazing. And I think the international community is observing that. 
And I think the test in that regard showed through the, the way in which the, the value of the currency responded. Um, it, was, it was not as negative as maybe people might have expected it. It barely um, moved. I mean, the JSE yeah, exactly. barely, barely, barely moved. The, the, the overall uh, currency market barely moved. It was almost as if, okay, it's a short-term anomaly, we'll get over it. Uh, the ratings agencies also, I mean, Fitch came out with a statement, um, I think it was Moody's also with a statement saying, it's negative for growth this year, but provided it is all brought back under control and um, the reform process that the president has embarked upon continues, then it's all okay. And I think that's the, it's important sometimes to zoom out a little bit. Um, and, and to uh, not zoom out, but zoom in, <laughs> uh, zoom out a little, um, and, and just to really get perspective yeah. on a, a much bigger story that is at play here, and it's not just about the last two weeks. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That uh, that proves the point. You said it exactly right there, as far as I'm concerned. But the the other side, of course, is the fact that we are in a competing world when it comes to the emerging markets. And, and, you know, South Africa is, is under threat as far as that is in terms of this competition uh, and much more so than, than in the past. Um, and, and we can't rely on, on our traditional commodities and things like that <laughs> that save the day for us so many times when it came to investment. But there are new areas that give me courage. Uh, and that let me point out that we have uh, for the last three years been busy with a project that is called the Public Private Growth Initiative, uh, <clears throat> started by a few of us uh, in support of government's growth ideals, particularly the president's growth targets, supporting these envoys in that regard, but especially bringing South African business, private sector, closer to government in the ongoing network and, uh, and platform for interaction between public and private. And I must say, I was, very, I was very encouraged with what I observed through what we are doing in that regard. It means regular interaction between government and private sector on a sectoral basis. And, and we've seen great successes, also some unresolved issues, but great successes in that space. What it points out and what I've learned in that process is that there are certain sectors in, those, in South Africa that, that are performing quite beyond what we have expected in the past. And maybe the one ex the great example in that regard is the global business services sector, uh, the call centers, so to speak, where uh, South Africa is now being rated as the number one um, uh, competitor in the world as far as destination for call centers are concerned. And, and, and I think those kind of things make us look different from where we were in the past. And, and then, of course, agriculture has performed extremely well in the recent uh, few years. Isn't and, that, and does that surprise you, considering the amount, and you've been very involved in the background ever since um, the ANC said, look, we get to look at land expropriation without compensation. And again, it was a PSG stage, I think perhaps the year after you were there, where Ino Gorongwana uh, came on stage and he went, well, you know, just because we said we're discussing it, it doesn't mean it's going to happen. And everybody went, yeah, right, of course not. Um, because there's so little trust in politicians and the political process. But what we've seen evolve over that time is a very calm and measured approach to land reform. There's lots of noise about what the EFF wants in terms of land under control of the state, please save us, um, and then lease to individuals. But there's huge pushback because what do individuals want? They want the, the security of tenure. They want to know yeah. that if they own a piece of land, whether it be 10 square meters or 10,000 square meters, that they've got the rights over that land and so yeah. that it can be well utilized and nurtured and nourished and looked after for future generations. I mean, that is, I think, our, our core instinct on this stuff. You've been yeah. intimately involved. Just Bring us up to speed as to where we are in the land discussion. Well, you know, I, I, I haven't followed everything uh, with regard to it, but I think, you know, from what I observe, on the one side, uh, the political debate is, is stumbling at the moment and it's going to, to end probably within this current situation where it finds itself stumbling over the fact that 
no change can be brought to the constitution without a two-thirds majority as far as the subject is concerned. And that is unattainable, it seems. So, um, so I, I think that the whole thing is going nowhere. And, and recent reports indicated that already. But what is at the heart of land reform? Uh, is not expropriation without compensation. What is necessary is to make land available to farmers who want to farm who do have that access to land. And I mean, the purpose has to be, and we've been at the number discussion I can recall where you and I and others participated, which you led, um, <clears throat> where this point was made very clearly, and that is make land available to people who want to, to actually use the land for commercial purposes. Because then we can add value. Add value for those that, that work the land, but also add value to the country as a whole. We have a huge potential as far as agricultural production is concerned. And the more farmers we can get to, to actually fill that requirement, the better. But, but to make land available just for, <laughs> for, for purposes of not uh, using it for commercial uh, aims and, and, and objectives, is not, is not going to serve any purpose. So, so what we are doing, at, or what we have done in recent times on the sidelines was to, through interaction between big commercial farmers and, uh, and small farmers, emerging farmers, and the agricultural business environment and so forth, we have developed a, a concept that, that in the end resulted in the establishment of the Ag Agricultural Development Agency a year ago. And that agency is, is in a starting phase still. It's a private institution, a mem member uh, institution, uh, but it has a, a big potential of serving the, the, the needs of the country in terms of bringing in new farmers, assisting them, supporting them by skills transfer, by making um, uh, uh, capital requirements available for proper farming purposes. And in this process, and this is the interesting thing, many people have started to speak out about it and, and realize that ownership of land is not the, the first requirement if you want to become a farmer. You can actually lease land in a very effective way. And the state has now started to do that. Because the state is the owner of at least 4,000 farms that have been expropriated over a period of time within the land redistribution uh, framework. And so the state is the owner of these farms and now they have started to lease it out. Uh, and once we can get those farms to be utilized, like I said, in a, in a commercial direction or for commercial purposes, then, then we can resolve the, the problem of land reform. And, and so I think we're starting to move in the right direction without all the nonsense about expropriation without compensation. Does South Africa have time for a managed, measured, sensible evolution of the economy and the sharing of the future? I ask this just simply because many people are clearly vulnerable to political rhetoric and clearly vulnerable to believing demagogues and, and people who, you know, litter the airwaves and litter social media with, with, with attractive sounding promises. Um, I, I just wonder whether we wasted an awful lot of time the last 27 years. We don't have another 27 ahead of us to fix it. Yeah, there's a lot of talk and little implementation sometimes. And I, I think the, the person who said it very clearly in, in several of his speeches recently was the president himself. We have come to the point of real need for implementation. I just hope that the state can develop the capacity to implement, you know, because if there is one shortcoming that, that bothers my mind, then it is the lack of a competent state uh, in many areas. We've seen it uh, very specifically at the local government level in recent times. But the same applies at, at provincial level and in many state departments at the national level. So, so you know, when we talk about implementation, it depends on do we have the capacity? Do we have the people that can implement the policies that have been created at the 
executive or parliamentary level. And, and, and land reform is such an, an example because the, 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 the policies that were enacted through various acts uh, is not the problem. It's actually the lack of implementation of those policies that, uh, that didn't happen. And, and, and now it remains a contentious issue, the whole subject of land reform. But at the same time, at the same time, Bruce, you know what, what struck me in recent weeks is the fact that when there was this opportunity of people getting totally out of hand uh, through the destructive way in which looting took place, et cetera, et cetera, it was at the same time the response from the vast majority of South Africans against that, you know, and it, that was an amazing feature and it still is. So, you know, despite all the opportunities for creating a populist agenda, I think South Africans in la at large don't have the appetite for that. I've been talking to a number of you know, senior retired executives, current executives, people who meet with government on a regular basis who through Ned Lack have had some very successful interactions with government and labor, and it's been quite remarkable in terms of how ESCOM has managed to put it through a unilateral 1% increase. The lights stayed on mostly, um, but no big disruption on that particular front, where there is this acceptance that actually we are in a bit of a hole and no, no single agenda is going to actually resolve our problems. But people like Mark Barnes, uh, the retired or resigned chief executive of the post office, people like Colin Coleman, former general manager of uh, Goldman Sachs in South Africa, people like them saying, come on, Lina, we want to come and we want to help. Mark Barnes being provocative on social media the other day saying, give me a hundred senior executives and we'll sort out South Africa in three years. He's exaggerating, of course, he, he wants effect. Um, Colin Coleman saying he'll give his time for nothing. Just give me a job to do and I will do it. Um, and it's that sort of willingness to step up that is, exists. And I wonder whether or not we're politically mature enough to accept that sort of help. Um, yeah, Barnes's point was, I went to the post office to teach and I ended up learning a lot more than I ever dreamt was possible. And he's a, a far more humble individual after the post office than before. Uh, and, and that's a, a big and positive thing. There is so much that can be done, but will we do it? my question to you as we wrap up. It's difficult, Bruce, because you, you're dealing with two different animals, private sector on the one side and public sector on the other side. And, and uh, I had some experience with in public sector in the bad old days of apartheid, but it's still the same. And you will find this in all countries that are in the world. The public sector has its own disciplines, its own characteristics, its own phenomena that you have to deal with. And the same with private sector. And this, and this thing that you can just integrate the two or make success of the one based on the success of the other is not going to work. What we need is a capable state from within. In other words, we have to have DGs that are there not as political deployees. And underneath them, a core of civil servants that just do the job because they have the interests of the state at mind. That is the ideal. Disciplined civil service at large. And if we can get that, then I don't think Mark Barnes or Colin Coleman or myself or any one of us would be bothered about the state because it would be capable of doing its job. But, but that is the building exercise that has to happen. And, and I really, really, if I have a, a desire to express, then it's this one, that the capable state will be seen in our lifetime as, a, as, as, as producing the required services that the nation wants. Uh, South Africa can't let itself down in this regard. And, and I would hope that if Cyril Ramaphosa wants a legacy, it's this one, to build a capable state. I think we see microcosms of what's possible. I mean, Andre de Reiter at ESCOM is, you know, his load shedding record is worse than many of his predecessors because he inherited a bigger mess 
from them <laughs> than before, but you watch him implementing processes, you watch him reinstilling discipline, and you watch him reinstate dignity within an organization, and there you get some hope. You look at Edward Kisveta at SARS, um, uh, and really, you know, Again, an incapable tax collection agency is the death of a country, and it did become incapable at reintroducing those capabilities. People are, are, are frustrated by Shamila Batoya, the National Prosecuting Authority, but few, I think, understand the magnitude of capture uh, and what it did to the destruction of confidence within those organizations. But gradually, these things are being rebuilt. We just need to spread that rebuilding ethos through a, a greater number of departments and entities and state-owned companies. But I think there are signs of that, not only those that you've mentioned. I mean, I, I watched Ronald Lamola last night as Minister of Justice, you know? And, and he, he, he leaves an impression on me as a young man who's coming through with determination. And the same can be said, I think, from my observation, I see it on television only, of, of the minister in the, in the office of the president, the acting minister in the office of the president, Kambutso in Shabeni. And, and, and both those are youngsters. You know? And if, if, if the kind of determination, energy, and, and direction that come out from their public appearances is an indication of, of new blood that's coming through, I think there's hope. Your... You know, you, you had a very close relationship and a very trusting relationship with the president before he was the president, when he was a negotiator, the ANC's chief negotiator. You still keep in contact. He still calls you in from time to time. Uh, what's your sense of the measure of the man who's severely criticized? Silence, Cyril, they used to call him. And now they you accuse, accuse him of hesitating to act and everybody's kind of expected to wear his underwear on the outside of his trousers and put on a cape and sort of you know, with a click of his fingers solve the country's problems and again it's a failure to understand the magnitude of the mess that he inherited what's your sense of where he is and his capability in his way to gradually and steadily make progress and uh, and in this repair job that the country so desperately needs well, first of all, I don't want his job. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think he does either, by the way. I, mean, I don't know for a fact, but there's some days when he doesn't look like he wants it either, but uh, he's yeah. left. I, I think he's, he's doing a good job, uh, Bruce. Uh, you know, and, and maybe I'm just su su subjective because I, I know him fairly well. Uh, and I'm an admirer of him. Uh, I think he's doing a good job. I listen to him towards the end of the, the recent unrest that one speech he made, I think it was on a Friday evening. Mm. Uh, and and uh, the mark I gave him was, this was a statesman at, uh, at work. Uh, I think the way in which he came across was putting the interest of the country first. And I think this is the first requirement for, for the president of the country. He was not putting the, the party's interest first. And, and at, the, at the same time, I think he's handling the contestation within the ANC in such a way that there's progress, progress towards re-establishing the center that I spoke about earlier. Um, and, and all the indications that I observe indicates in that direction. Um, if, if he didn't give the leadership, I think, of the last two or three years that he did, we would, would have seen far bigger trouble now during the recent unrest than we would have seen. And that is surely a measure of success for him. And he came out of that when it was a major challenge to his authority and the country's stability. But firstly, his authority. And he came out of it stronger than we he went into it. And I think that's an indication that he's winning, that he's moving in the right direction. He will not always do everything that everybody will support. It's impossible. Nobody in that capacity can, he can do that. But I think he's, he's, uh, he's moving in the right direction. And you know what? I'm saying to myself, <clears throat> 
from the, the fortunate position where I'm sitting, and that is having no responsibility. <laughs> if I compare him uh, with world leaders, I'm proud of him. I'm proud of the fact that South Africa has a president like him at this stage, compared to others. And you can name them across the world. We don't have an Erdogan. We don't have a Bolsonaro. But thank goodness we don't have a Trump. <laughs> Ruth, thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, Ruth Mayer, thank you for sharing your insights with us and your wisdom with us and your experience with us. Charles, we'll leave it up to you to wrap up. Thank you, Bruce and Ruth. A couple of points I've picked up was that government definitely needs to revisit our security system. And as uh, Rulf have actually mentioned further, the importance of government to address inequality, poverty and uh, unemployment. And I think it's, uh, it's all factors that we're all very familiar with. Uh, uh, with. Then some positive points uh, that have been mentioned by both uh, Bruce and Rulf was that the country is moving in the right direction. We have a solid democracy in place. And... Roof also mentioned the excellent work that has been done by civil society over the last number of years. And in addition, Roof also spoke about the longevity of the constitution in its current form and that he actually believed that it's well and solid in place. And just to conclude, a skilled and trusted financial advisor can be invaluable during these uncertain times. They can provide objective insights and help you consider alternative scenarios so you can make considered and rational decisions on your wealth and insurance portfolios. If you have an advisor, I encourage you to engage with them. And if you don't, then please get in touch with us. We welcome your feedback, so please communicate with us and be sure to register for our next exciting speaker in the Think Big series, where we will discuss the future of women in leadership with Charlize Theron. Thank you for attending today's session.